morning, Bible Center family. It's so good to be with you this morning. Welcome. Join us for worship. Good morning. Good morning. We're so happy that you're here. We want you to check in on the chat. And so I have a trivia question for you this morning because we're getting ready for our trivia night on Friday. So put in the chat, do you know in inches, what is the diameter of a standard basketball hoop? Put it in there because we're getting ready for trivia night. So that's when all of those random facts will um, we'll help you win a prize. And so again, as we're getting ready for worship, check it on the chat. What's the diameter of a standard basketball hoop? Have a good morning. We'll see you in a few minutes for worship. Father, we're just so grateful this morning that your mercies were new this morning and that there is none like you this morning, God. We come this morning, Father God, grateful for your presence, grateful for the opportunity to worship you, grateful for the opportunity to lift your name up, O oh God, and to exalt you in this place. Father, even in our homes, we just say thank you for who you are and for what you have done. We thank you, Father God for all the ways that you have made, all the doors that you have opened, and even for the doors that you have closed. We praise you today, Father God, and we're excited, oh God, to have the opportunity to worship you in spirit and in truth. So, Father, in this time, we just ask, God, that we would meet you and that you would meet us, Lord God. Speak to our hearts, Father God, and we promise, oh God, to give you praise in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Come on, somebody rejoice this morning. If you're excited about the fact that God made a way, hallelujah, when your back was against the wall and you didn't know how you were going to make it, thank you, Lord.
swell with the rain. Let the songs of my heart, let them rise to bless your name and flow to you, flow to you. Let my worship, you are my hiding place. You are my hiding place. You are my shelter and my hiding.
right where you are, come on, open your mouth and give God a praise out of your lips. Come on, tell him, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. And we sing praises to your name. Oh, Lord, praises to your name. Oh, Lord, for your name is great. to your name, oh Lord, for your name is great and greatly to be praised. Come on one time, we give glory to your name. We give glory to your name, oh Lord, glory to your name, oh Lord, for your name. Everybody take a moment in the chat and just say good morning. Come on, welcome your brothers and sisters in Christ. If you're on bcpgh.online.church, come on, go in the chat. If you're on Facebook, come on, everybody go in the comments and put up those smiley emojis. Welcome your family. And let everybody know how much you love them this morning. We love you. Those of us that are here in the sanctuary this morning, we send you our virtual hugs, letting you know how much we love you. Would you take a moment and just thank the Lord this morning for our pastors? Pastor John and Pastor Cynthia are getting ready to come back and greet us this morning. Would you just take a moment and welcome them and love on them? Oh, we sing praises to your name. Oh, Lord, praises to your name. A shout out to Sister Joan, who knew that that standard diameter was 18 inches. All right, I have one more for you, because we're really working up to trivia night on Friday. Who knows what Sleeping Beauty's name really was? Now, these are some random things. These are great trivia facts that are going to win you some prizes on Friday. So put it in the chat. What was Sleeping Beauty's real, uh, what was her real name? So again, glad that you're here with us this morning. Want to, um, my husband just knows I'm, I'm a game player. I love it. I'm, I'm excited already for Friday. So again, if you're here with us for the first time, we want to encourage you to check in at bcpgh.info. There's a little tab that says, I'm new. Please put your information in there. We're going to send you a gift. And again, we're just so glad that you're worshiping with us on today. We're going to pray for our children. It is one of the most important things that we do at Bible Center every Sunday. Children are a gift from God, and it is our duty to just raise them in a way that they will be um, adults that will love and serve God. And so if you have children who are near you, I ask that you just gather them. Maybe you want to get someone on the phone or just get a child in your heart. And please join me as we pray. Dear God, this morning, we just come to you, first of all, thanking you for life, health, and strength. God, we thank you now for our children, the children that you have placed in our lives. God, whether they're children that you have given us biologically, whether they're spiritual children, God, maybe they're just neighbors and friends, God. But we ask now that you would just cover them. We're praying, God, for their health. We're praying, God, for their minds. We're praying, God, for resources in their families so that they won't have any needs. God, we ask 
that you would just give them godly relationships, godly friendships, God, even relationships at school. God, we pray that these children will grow to be leaders, that they will know you, that they will be strong in their word. Even those children now who are participating in our Bible challenge, God, as they are reading your word every day, God, I ask that there won't just be words on a page, but that it will go deep, that it will be life changing. And we just pray all of these things in your name. Amen. Well, we're excited this morning for uh, a word from Pastor John. I do believe we're going to learn about how we can begin to see ourselves as God sees us. And so you'll want to make sure that you have something to write with, something to take some notes, because this word will help to transform you. We're not just people who listen to the word on Sundays and put it away until next week. We are people that really apply that word. And so, again, welcome, Pastor John. We're excited about that word. Thank you. Good morning, Bible Center. Good morning, family. Good to see you. Always good to gather again in the house of the Lord. Uh, again, this has been another challenging, trying week, particularly uh, in the political frame and also uh, the situation with uh, Breonna Taylor. And so I just want to take a moment to uh, set our minds and our hearts right uh, through prayer. So please join me. Father, in the name of Jesus. Look, God, we find ourselves in such trying and difficult times. Father God, particularly weighing on my heart, Lord God, is uh, the murder of another black woman, Lord God, at the hands of law enforcement. And Lord God, we recognize the complexities and the situations and all of that. But God, we recognize, Lord God, that we find ourselves in a place that is misaligned with the principles of the kingdom, your will being done on earth as it is in heaven. So Father, many of us find ourselves frustrated. Some angry, Lord God, almost all exhausted, Lord God, just by the sheer weight and the volume of the challenges that we face. And so, God, I ask that you would go bring strength, Lord God, bring peace, bring wisdom, Lord God, and help our nation to be a place that is also committed, Lord God, to justice. Lord God, we pray for those who are mourning today, those, Lord God, who over and over experience the loss of loved ones. Lord God, in those not only just at the hands of the police, Lord God, but the coronavirus, Lord God, and just the diseases that are unfortunately exacerbated by the moments in which we find ourselves. Father, I pray for your strength. Lord God, I pray for this nation. I pray for America. Lord God, I pray that you would bring your peace. Lord God, that you would bring your harmony. Lord God, that you would direct us, even as spiritual leaders, Lord God, to be able to communicate with power, Lord God, the importance and the value of your peace. Lord God, the peace that you say in your word passes all understanding, Lord God, that peace that will guard our hearts and minds, even in the midst of the craziness going on around us. <clears throat> Father, we pray for your peace. Lord God, I pray, Lord God, that you would give my brothers and sisters, my fathers, my sons, my sons and daughters, Lord God, my fathers and mothers, Lord God, all of your people, that you would give us, Lord God, a word, that you would give us, Lord God, the ability to speak hope, to speak life, Lord God, to give people that sense, that understanding that in spite of all that is going on, we, your people, can be used to demonstrate and to bring the power of your presence into the earth. Lord God, you called us and you told us in your word in Jeremiah 29, Lord God, that you've called us to be people who seek the peace and the prosperity of our cities. And God, not just speak, but you say to pray and then to work. And so as people are asking, where is God? Lord God, you are in us. And so God, I ask that you would mobilize your people, Lord God, to demonstrate your power in the earth, your power over the enemy. Your power, Lord God, over sin. Your power over anger. Your power, Lord God, over injustice. Lord God, we need your help. And so, Father, I pray a supernatural anointing, the zeal and an inspiration, Lord God, for your people, irrespective of their race, irrespective of whatever party they may uh, announce or uh, align themselves with, Lord God. The only power that we are aligned to is the power of the kingdom and the party of the kingdom. The only leader, Lord God, that we are ultimately responsible to is the king. And so, Father, we ask that you would allow the power of the kingdom and its influence, Lord God, to be the primary focus of our life. You said in your word that we should seek first the kingdom and its righteousness. 
and all of the other things that weigh on our hearts, all the other things we desire, the other things that we want to see. Lord God, you said you will bring those to pass. So in the name of Jesus, we proclaim that the power of the kingdom of God and his king, Jesus, is the number one driver, the number one authority in our earth today. And we, Lord God, will demand and command that your people will step up and bring the influence of your kingdom into every situation, every circumstance, even into the divisiveness that's in our nation, Lord God, I pray that the people of God, black, white, red and yellow and brown, Lord God, that we will step up and stand up and make your priority our priority. Lord God, we will relinquish any allegiance that comes before our allegiance to you. The Lord God, we will not allow these boxes of political party to frame us or shape us, but rather, God, we will proclaim that the kingdom of God and our king is the only one to have whom we have allegiance. And so if we are affiliated with some party, we will bend that party. We will shift its priorities to the priorities of our king. And so, Father, we need you. We need you to speak peace. We need you, Lord God, to bring your power and your influence as the driving force in our nation and even in our world. Lord God, we pray for those who are suffering, who are suffering financially, those who are suffering in their minds, Lord God, the sickness and the weight of the world, Lord God, has them sick in their thinking. Lord God, those who are restless, those who are overwhelmed, Lord God, those who are sad, Lord God, those who their minds, Lord God, keep them from being able to think and rest. Lord, in the name of Jesus, even the issues of mental health, Lord God, that are running rampant through our time and that moment in life, Lord God, we ask that you would bring power. And then we will turn to your word. And that your people who are bringing your word, Lord God, will have a word that is driven by you, that is filled with your spirit. And so, Father, whoever's watching today, whoever's listening, and who will, even in the days and weeks to come, God, I ask that you would allow your spirit to go forth from this time, Lord God, in this word that we will speak today, that it will be a fit and timely word, that, Lord God, it will lift us up, that it will motivate, that it will encourage, Lord God, and it will remind us of who you are and that you're greater than Corona-19. Lord God, that you're greater than our politicians, Lord God, that you're greater than seeing, you're greater than the work of the enemy who ultimately seeks to destroy us and to have us. But, Father, we are your people, and therefore we proclaim that our citizenship a citizen of the kingdom of God gives us the authority over the earth and to take and exercise dominion in every sphere in which we find ourselves. So, Father, I thank you in advance for this word. I thank you for what you're doing and what you're going to do. And I pray this prayer now in the name, the power, and the authority of Jesus Christ, our King. Amen. Amen. So, again, it's always a pleasure to be here and have the opportunity to share with you today. And we're talking about and continue our conversation about how to reinvent ourselves, how to become the person that God created us to be, how to reinvent ourselves, how to shift in our thinking and our understanding of who God created us to be, to be the one that God designed, desired, and intends for us to be. And so the question I want to start this morning with is, who is it that God has called you to be? Put differently, what problem has God assigned to you to solve? And then for whom are you supposed to solve it? Do you realize that God created you? He placed you here. He put you here. He birthed you. He allowed you to be born, to be a part of the earth, to solve a problem. And so the question that we're asking as we talk about this notion of reinventing ourselves is what problem has God called and created us to solve? And unfortunately, many believers don't know the answer to that question. And in fact, many of us not only don't know the answer to the question, we're not even asking it. And so instead of being <clears throat> about the business of the kingdom and being about what God has created us to do, that thing that will fulfill us, that thing that will um, help us to be uh, uh, who he created us to be, that thing that will in fact give us joy, 
We find ourselves distracted and worried by so many things that are going on, often a sense of dread, the anticipation that bad things are going to be happening, that, that persistent feeling of worthlessness, uselessness, uselessness, like my life doesn't matter. But that's not what God wants us to be about. He wants us to be asking, God, who have you created me to be? What piece of the earth am I supposed to be bringing under your authority? And so while, of course, it's normal once in a while to maybe get a little anxious or worried, and of course, we have these protective mechanisms built into us to make us pay attention, but we're not supposed to be in a constant state of worry and fear and distraction. And in fact, it's just the opposite. God says in his Bible, in John chapter 10, verse 10, the thief, our enemy, comes for what reason? Only to steal, to kill, and destroy. But Jesus makes the announcement. He says, listen, the reason that I came is that you would have life and have it more abundantly. And so that doesn't mean that difficulties won't come. I was in a conversation earlier this week with uh, one of our ministers, Brother Tony, and he said, you know, that it's the challenges of life that give life texture. It gives life that sense of fulfillment. You only celebrate wins when there's a challenge, right? If you go, you play a sport and you beat a team 100 to 10 or something like that, there's really no excitement there. But when you win by one point at the buzzer or something, that's a very different thing. And so life comes and it certainly brings challenges, but we become more like Jesus Christ and we grow and we stretch in our faith. As we overcome through the power of the spirit that lives in us, it makes us more and more and more like Jesus. And so that abundant life that Jesus promised, that abundant life is not that there won't be challenges, it's not that there won't be difficulties, but we know that we overcome. We are overcomers. We are conquerors through him who loved us. And so Jesus came. He says, I came that you would have life and have that more abundantly. And so today, the sermon in a sentence, if I was going to summarize it, the way to become the person that God wants us to be, it requires faith. And so the sermon in a sentence is simply have faith in God. Have faith in God. Have faith in God. And so, of course, the question is, what is faith? Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1 says, now faith is the insurance. And I'm reading out of the uh, Amplified Bible. It says, faith is the assurance or the confirmation of things hoped for. Those things that are divinely guaranteed. And the evidence of things not seen. The conviction of the reality. Faith comprehends as fact what cannot be experienced by the physical senses. So faith is almost like this sixth sense, right? We smell, we hear, we taste, we touch. Uh, missing one. Taste, touch, feel. Come on, help me, people. What's the one I'm missing? We see. That's right. We see. <laughs> and so we have these five senses. But faith is like a sixth sense. It says it's not so much about what we see because our seeing, what we can see with our natural eyes, there's something beyond that. And oftentimes, and we'll see today in our, our kind of core story, what we see is misaligned with what we believe. But when we have faith, it allows us to go beyond our sight. It's this sixth sense. It's this additional sense beyond our five senses that faith gives us the assurance. It is that confidence in who God is and that what he said he will do because he's God. And so faith is an assurance. Now, also the result of faith when we believe God and we believe in who he is, we believe that he'll do what he says he will do, then we then, of course, become people who are God-centered. And that God-centeredness, that belief that God is who he says he is, that he'll do what he says he can do, that becomes the thing that gives us optimism. It makes us happier. It gives us a sense of joy. It gives us a sense of peace. So in the midst of all that is going on, in my prayer, I said that peace that passes all understanding. We can have that peace because we have faith in God. We have faith in who God is and what he says in his word. And it is that faith that gives us that hope, that optimism, that the result of our faith is God being the center of our lives. And then we're able to bring hope. We're able to bring joy. We're able to experience abundance even in the midst of what other people may be experiencing lack. And then the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, for we walk or we live by faith, not by sight. So this interplay of our natural senses and the sixth sense, if you will, that sense that God gives us that comes through faith. We live, we walk, our existence comes 
through faith. So let's look at the power of faith. A couple key scriptures in the Bible in chapter 17 of the book of Luke. The apostle said to the Lord, increase our faith. And the Lord said, if you had a faith like a grain of a mustard seed, you could say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the seed, it would obey you. Jesus said, I don't know if you've ever seen a mustard seed, very little, tiny seed. He says, it doesn't take a whole lot of faith. They're like, God, increase our faith, help, help us. He's like, listen, you just need a little bit of faith. If you understand faith, because it is not your faith, but it is in whom you have faith. He says, if you believe that God is who he says he is, and if you know that he will do what he says he will do, if you have just a little bit of faith, he says, you could say to this tree, be gone, and it would be uprooted and cast into the sea. And then in Mark chapter 11, verses 22 to 24, Jesus says, has faith in God. Truly, I tell you, if anyone says to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea and does not doubt in their heart, but believes what they say will happen, it will be done for them. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you received it and it will be yours. Jesus is saying, listen, and again, he's using hyperbole, right? He's using extreme language. He's saying, you say to the mountain, go, it'll jump into the sea. Now, I don't know that there's any reason why we would need to tell a mountain to go jump into the sea and that would create all kinds of problems. But Jesus is saying, listen, the point is that faith is powerful and faith is effective and faith but your belief makes things happen. I'll give you an example, and if you're reading uh, along with us as we're doing the spiritual disciplines, or if you're studying your scriptures in, in the book of Matthew, the book of Luke, this ongoing series of Jesus saying, people coming to him, and people, he's, they're asking for something. I want to give you one story that we're uh, maybe familiar with. There was a woman who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. I'm in Matthew chapter 9, verse 20. She'd been subject to bleeding for 12 years, and she came up behind Jesus, right? So you get the picture. This woman, and I imagine she might even be on her knees. She's trying to sneak up because Jesus is in a crowd, and he's headed somewhere on his way to take care of something else. But this woman sneaks up behind him, if you will, and says she touched the edge of his cloak. And I like this part. She said to herself, she's talking to herself. The message that she gives herself is this. If I only touch his cloak. I will be healed. And so the message, the words that come out of her mouth are in alignment with the belief that she has in her heart. And she says, if I can just touch his cloak, I will be healed. In verse 22, Jesus turned and he saw her. And he says, take heart, daughter. He said, you're what? Your faith has healed you. And the woman was healed at that moment. Jesus didn't even touch her. She touched him. But because she had faith when she touched Jesus, he says, I believe in, in the, the version that's in, in, in Mark, he says, somebody touched me like Jesus. All these people, what are you talking about? He's like, no, no, no. Somebody touched me in faith. Somebody touched me believing that I had what they need. And so she touched him. And he says, I felt the power leave. And so when we believe, and this woman said to her herself, the message that we give ourselves, the message that we speak to ourselves, determines in large part our reality. And so this woman's message, she said to herself, if I can just touch Jesus. And he said, listen, I can't even deny it because why your faith has made you whole. And if you're reading with us again, the blind guy comes up. Jesus is going through, and they're like, the guy's like, Jesus, Jesus. He says, what do you want? He says, I want to see. And what does Jesus say? He says, your faith has made you well. The leprous man, Jesus, heal us, heal us. He says, go, your faith has made you well. And so our faith, this is key to understanding who God is desires for us to be. And so if you want to know who God has made you to be, if you want to revisit who God designed you to be from the beginning, if you want to reinvent yourself, have faith in God. Now, faith works, but it requires work. James chapter 2, verses 14 and on, it says, what good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but doesn't have works? You see, faith is not just an intellectual assent. 
But in fact, an agreement, if you will. But faith works. So when you believe, you begin to act as if that thing has already happened. That's why it says faith is the evidence of things hopeful. The, the, I mean, is the, things that, the evidence of things that we don't yet see. They're not in our vision yet. But they're already there. And so when we have faith, we act on it. And he says, somebody says they have faith, but they don't have works. Can that faith save them? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says, go in peace, be warm and filled, without giving them things that they need for the body, what good is that? You know, you're saying, God bless you. I need a couple of dollars. you telling me God bless me. I don't need God to bless me uh, in, in, in words. I need God to bless me with a couple of dollars. So I need you to hit me with that 20. You see, and then the blessing has already happened. But what good is that if you're just saying, well, so faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. And so because I believe, because I have faith, because God's word is true, then I will act as if I will conduct myself. So if God told you to start the business, you get your incorporation together. You begin talking to people. You begin gathering information. You research that thing. So if God said have the business, you begin to act as if you're going to do it, as the business is going to exist. You don't say, God, I'm just waiting on you. You see, waiting is great, but we wait in expectation. And so true faith actually motivates us to move. <laughs> Verse 19 says, you believe that God is one. You do well. But guess what? Even the demons believe and shudder. Do you know Satan has more faith in God than you have? He has more faith in God than I have. He knows beyond the shadow of a doubt that every word of God is true, that his destiny is done, that it's a wrap. But his job is to keep us from believing that God is true. He spends his effort and energy to deceive us because he knows beyond the shadow of a doubt that God is real. God is all-powerful. He's omniscient, omnipotent, omniscient. He knows everything. And you see various places in the New Testament. The demons are like, Jesus, please don't, don't cast us out yet. Don't cast us into the abyss. This is before Jesus cast them into the, 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 the swine. And they're like, don't cast us into the abyss. We know our future is secure because you've already said what's going to happen. We know we're already defeated. But when we as the people of God, when we don't operate in faith, we don't believe who God is. And we don't believe that his word is true. We find ourselves depressed and anxious and in lack. And finally, in verse 26, he says, for the body apart from the spirit is dead. So also faith apart from works is dead. So our faith requires that we begin to behave as if. You remember years ago, this was probably in 2010, 11 or something. No, it was before that. We had looked at the building that I'm standing in. And they told us, the owners of the, of the building at that time was the city. And they're like, no, you can't buy that building. You can't have that building. We're reserving that for retail. We're going, no, you can't have it. You know, a church. Why? No, we're not doing that. Well, I don't need to tell you. I'm standing here talking about it. I'm in it, right? Look around me. And so the notion that we couldn't have it, that was misaligned with the faith that we had. And we said, God, I remember this thing. I remember my, my aunt telling me how when my grandfather moved to Pittsburgh, he laid his hands on 7214 Tioga Street and prayed over that space and prayed and asked God for it. And so, I, you know, it's like when you play sports. I don't know about you, but when I was, I was growing up, I, I, I was a football fan, loved the Steelers, right? So I'd play most positions. So I'd see myself, if I was on defense, I'd be Jack Lambert in the middle, waiting for somebody to come through. Or I'd be Lynn Swan catching the ball. I'd be, uh, I, I don't know, I wasn't a Terry Bradshaw fan, I like that. But anyway, I would be Lynn Swan or John Stowe. I'd be catching the ball. I'd be Mean Joe Green, right, coming off the line, smacking somebody's helmet, giving people concussions. I would play the role. And so I imagined myself as my grandfather. Next gen, they told me we couldn't have the building. I laid my hands on the building, and I began to pray and say, God, this is your will. This is what we desire. This is what we want. And so even though they told us we couldn't have it, faith says something different. And so today we stand in this space that we use for ministry, the space that we use for children, the space that we use to distribute food, the space that we use to worship, the space that we'll have our commercial kitchen in a few weeks, the space that they told us we couldn't have. You see, faith, it said that we could. 
And that story just repeats over and over. And I'm sure you, it, those of you listening, my, my mom is probably listening, that faith when my father was paralyzed from the waist down, and they said he would never walk again. That faith when they rolled Aunt Lib into that room and said there's nothing else we can do, we just going to wait. That faith, Sister Carl, well, that faith, you know what I'm talking about. That situation that people didn't think you could come through, but you did. That faith, those of you among us who've been sick, those of you who had that young person, that child who people told you to give up on, but you would refuse. You said, I have faith because of what I planted in the child, that faith. That faith when you lost your job, but you held on, that faith. That same faith. Hold on to that faith because that faith gives us that illogical, that, 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 that uh, optimism that don't make no sense to people for watching. But we know in whom we have faith. And that person, that being our God, our Father, that faith that we have in him is the faith that delivers. And so we say, God, I surrender my will to yours. And you'll give me what I ask for or even something better. That faith. And so this morning, we're going to look at this guy named Gideon. And I think we talked about him a little bit uh, about six months ago. But we're going to dig a little bit more deeply into his story. First of all, Judges chapter 6. I'm going to start at verse 1, a little quick background, then we'll go from there. Verse 1, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. And for seven years, he gave them into the hands of the Midianites. And so this is just a series of of ongoing, repeating stories. The Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. So God's people, they had finally gotten into the, the promised land. Joshua had led them into the promised land. They were in the land that flows with milk and honey. They were enjoying life. And unfortunately, they then turned to living life like the Canaanites, the people who they were supposed to get out of the land they kept compromising with them. And then, in fact, began worshiping idols and began even killing their own children. And all the things that God had told them not to do, his children, the Israelites, began to do. And so they would then did evil, do evil in the sight of the Lord. The Midianites would come or others would come, uh, take control of them, oppress them. They would cry out to the Lord, Lord, God, forgive us. Lord, God, we're sorry. Please restore us, renew us. And then God would send a judge. He would send a political leader to deliver them. And there would be a deliverance and a time of peace. And the cycle would repeat over and over and over again. So we're in one of those cycles. They did evil, and the Lord gave them in the hands of the Midianites. So because of their evil, God allowed the enemy to have control over them. Now, jumping to verse 12, when the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. What an amazing sense of assurance. What an opportunity for faith. It says, first of all, the Lord is with you. God is with you. And then he calls him what? Mighty warrior. Can't you imagine feeling good that this, this angel comes out of nowhere? You're like, okay, after I'm done being scared. He says, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. But watch what my God Gideon says. Pardon me, my Lord. But if the Lord is with us, now he went from him to us. If the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Well, wait a minute. We just discovered in verse 1 what happened was the disobedience of the people. But God, if the Lord is with us, why has this happened? Where are all his wonders that our ancestors told us about when they said, did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? Where is God now? And don't we find ourselves asking, how are we in the midst of a pandemic? If God loves us, if God is a God of love, how in the world? Do we find ourselves in a situation where people are sick and dying? But we know our reality and the answer to that is sin. It's disobedience, disobedience to the laws, the principles of the kingdom. And so we find ourselves, the human condition is one in which we find ourselves in disobedience. And so he says, but now the Lord has abandoned us and given us in the hand of Midian. And unfortunately, there's so many believers who now, instead of calling out to the Lord in faith, instead of believing, they're feeling like the Lord has abandoned us. We're out here by ourselves. We, we, we have no control. Even the, you know, the, the, the government is doing this. The police is doing, are doing that. But we as God's people, we have the power to bring influence and change. And it says the Lord turned to him and said, 
Go in the strength that you have and save Israel out of Midian's hands. Am I not sending you? He said, man, go ahead with that nonsense. He said, go in the strength that you have. And you might not think that it's enough. He says, but go in the little bit that you have. Go, because I'm going to deliver. I'm sending you. And watch what my boy Gideon says. <laughs> Verse 15, same thing. Uh, Pardon me, my Lord. But how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh. And I'm the least in my family. Right? And so God... Introduce, he says, God is with you, mighty warrior. But God's, well, but I mean, you know, we're, Midian's over, we're under control. We don't have no say. There's the COVID 19. I lost my job. The stuff is just bad right now. And God says, Go in the strength that you have, the little bit that you have. The Lord is with you. But how can I go? I'm my clan and my family's weak, and I'm the least in my weak family. And so this guy has no faith despite what the angel of the Lord is saying. This is a man of God with no faith. In verse 16, the Lord answered, speaking through the angel, I will be with you, and you will strike down all the Midianites, leaving none alive. God is speaking if we're listening. But we're so distracted by the Midianites. We're so distracted by the economy. We're extracted by, distracted by COVID-19. We're distracted by racism and sexism and classism and all the other isms. We're distracted. And so, unfortunately, we can't hear the voice of the Lord commissioning us to go and change the situation. So in verse 16, Gideon replied, if. Here we go again with the if. He started with, the Lord is with you, man. Mighty warrior. Gideon's back and said, well, if now I have found favor in your eyes. Well, give me a sign. He's like, dude, one more sign do you need? I'm an angel, bro. <laughs> dude, I came out the sky. Are you kidding me right now? All right, man, give me a sign. That is you, you're, that it is really you talking to me. He's like, bro, what are you talking about? We're having a conversation right now. What sign do you need other than you having a conversation with an angel? Please, so Gideon says, please do not go away until I come back and bring my offering and set it before you. And the Lord says through the angel, I will wait until you return. So Gideon goes inside, says he prepares a young goat. He makes some bread. He puts the meat in a basket, puts it in a pot. He brings them and he offers them under the oak tree. The angel of the Lord God said to him, verse 20, take the meat and the unleavened bread, place them on this rock and pour out the broth. And so you got the picture. He, he takes the, the, the goat soup pours it out in the bread. Gideon did so, verse 21. Then the angel of the Lord touched the meat and the unleavened bread with the tip of the staff that was in his hand. Watch this. Fire flared from the rock. So the rock bursts into flame, consumes the meat and the bread, and the angel of the Lord disappears. And so you would think that Gideon is like, whoo, that dude was an angel. That was crazy. The rock caught on fire. Burn it. All right, I'm, I'm convinced. I'm so, what do I need to do? Then verse 36, Gideon said to God, if you will save Israel by my hand as you have promised. Right? He still got a faith problem. My man's like, if, all right, God, if you're going to do what you said you're going to do, if you're going to keep your promise, look, I will place a wool fleece on the threshing floor. And if there's dew on only the fleece and the ground is dry, then I will know that you will save Israel by my hand as you have said. So he says, listen, I'm going to put this blanket out. This fleece blanket. Now, if there's only dew on the fleece, but the ground around it is dry, then God, I'm convinced, I'm sold. You spoke, I hear you, I'm ready to go get it. And so what happens? Gideon rose early the next day. He squeezed the fleece and wrung out the dew, a bowl full of water. So the fleece was full of water, the dew had come on the fleece, the ground around was dry, was dry in alignment with the test, right? Watch this. Then Gideon says to God, all right, God, I'm ready. Let's do it. No, he doesn't. He says, uh, don't be angry with me, but uh, let me make just one more request. Allow me one more test with the fleece. We're going to do this fleece test again. But this time, I want the fleece to be dry, and I want the ground to be wet. Let's try that version. And so <laughs> that night, God did so. Only the fleece was dry, and all the ground was covered with dew. 
You think that would be enough, right? Let's see what happens. So Gideon does make movement, and in fact, he recruits an army. He blows the trumpet, and people come from everywhere. In fact, over 20,000 men. And so early in the morning, Judges chapter 7, verse 1, Gideon and all his men camped at the spring of Herod. The camp of Midian was the north of the valley, the hill of Morah. And the Lord said to Gideon, you have too many men. I cannot deliver Midian into their hands, or Israel will boast against me. And they would say, my own strength has saved me. So sometimes, you see, God intervenes in what we feel like we need because he could now see. Gideon had over 20,000 guys. He's ready to go. He's like, all right, let's fight. But God says, no, 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 man, you got too much. You can see too much. You think that then the, 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 the winning of this battle is because you have such a great army. You got too much stuff. You got too many people. And so he tells them, you got to send them away. And so he goes through a couple rounds and so forth, and he ends up, verse 8, so he sent the rest of the Israelites home, but he kept 300 who took over the provisions and the trumpets of the others. Now the camp of Midian lay below him in the valley. So God's like, no, if you have all these people, you're like, we did this through our own might. And so sometimes God denies us in order that we have to continue to have faith. Because listen, if he had 21, 22,000 people and he was going into battle, he'd be like, oh, we got this. I got squad. But God is like, no, you don't need all those people. We just need about 300. And so when the victory happens, you will have to continue to have faith. So even if you're in the middle of something and you're trying to figure it out, you're, you're like, okay, God, I want to start this business, but I just need $50,000 to start. And once I get my 50, I'm ready. And God's like, no, no, 50 would maybe give you a little too much confidence. Or God, if, if, if I have, uh, you know, if, if you just let me finish this degree, I get my MBA, then I can really start this business. But God say, no. We're going to use the education that you got. You don't necessarily need an MBA. Are you like, God, well, you know, I, I'm, supposed to, um, I'm supposed to start this new ministry, but uh, I, need, I need, you know, I, I need at least 20 people on my squad because, um, you know, this stuff is hard. God's like, no, maybe the two or three that I gave you, that, that's probably enough. Because why? He does not want us to have confidence in ourselves. He does not want us to be so uh, enamored with the amount or or the resources that we have that we no longer have to have faith. And so the risk is when you find yourself in abundance that you lose faith. And so being lean and maybe that sense of I don't quite have, that, that, that keeps, us, keeps us on our knees. It makes us pray, say, God, I need you, even though I have. And so he finds himself with his 300 guys and the, Looking at the camp of Midian in verse 9, it says, During the night the Lord said to Gideon, Get up. Go down against the camp because I'm going to give it into your hands. And if, watch this, he says, If you're afraid to attack, because he knows how Gideon is, go down to the camp with your servant Pura and listen to what they are saying. And afterwards, you will be encouraged to attack the camp. And so you would, you would think, right, that our God was like, oh, no, God, man, you've shown yourself strong on my behalf. You did the whole fleece thing. I, I got this. And then, you know, like how in the movies, they'd be like, and then five minutes later, what do you do? So he and Pura, his servant, went down. <laughs> He's like, God, you know I'm scared. Stop playing. And so he went down to the outpost of the camp. And the Midianites, the Amalekites, and all the other eastern people had settled in the valley thick as locusts. So imagine that like you have this big, giant crowd, multiple nations Big giant army. He says their camels could not be counted more than the sand on the seashore could be counted. You got my boy with his 300 guys, and you got this giant army. They have these camels that serve as their transportation, right? These are armored vehicles. And Gideon is like, oh, man, here we go. Verse 13, Gideon arrived just as a man was telling a friend his dream. He's saying to his friend, and so Gideon is, is with his, his servant, and they're kind of hiding, I imagine, in the bush or, or in the rocks or something. And he says, I had a dream. A round loaf of barley bread came tumbling down into the Midianite camp. It struck the tent with such force that the tent overturned and collapsed. And his friend 
said, this could be nothing other than the sword of Gideon, the son of Joash, the Israelite. God has given the Midianites into and the whole camp into his hands. So verse 15 says, when Gideon heard the dream and his interpretation, he bowed down and worshiped. Listen, he got his confidence. He believed. He finally had faith. When he heard this guy say, Gideon and his army, and he didn't know, the guy didn't know that Gideon's army was only 300 people. But he says, this dream I've had, Gideon and his army and his sword, they overthrow our whole game. And then he went back to his, his people. He said, get up. The Lord has given the Midianite camp into your hand. And so with his 300 guys, and it says they had uh, clay pots, and they had trumpets, and they blew the trumpets, and they broke the pots. And it says just the 300 of them, it says while they stood, that the army of Midian, they turned on each other, and they took out their swords, and they began to slay each other, and they began to run. And Gideon's guys literally didn't even have to fight. His 300 cats didn't have to worry about how many thousands there were because God intervened, but he showed them. He says, if you just believe, if you have faith in me, I'll fight the battle for you, but you got to show up. Your faith has to be followed up with some work. You'd be like, all right, God, I can't do it by myself, but I'm going to do it with you. And then the Lord gave the army into his hand. And so the question, all right, Pastor, I hear you. And I buy this notion, but how do we grow our faith? And this is so important. Romans chapter 10, verse 17 says, Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Faith comes by hearing God's word, and hearing through the words of Jesus Christ. And so the question is, are you fighting your faith? Are you battling against your faith by what you're hearing? Do you allow the enemy's words? Right? What are, you, what are you binging on? Right? I know a lot of people at home and so and they're binging on stuff. And so what are you are you binging on the word of God? Are you watching sermon after sermon? You'd be like, ooh, am I, I'm gonna go watch Pastor's old sermons. <laughs> or whoever you listening. Are you binging on that? Or are you binging on foolishness? Are you binging on shows that highlight adultery, fornication, murder, mayhem, foolishness? Are you filling your mind? Are you hearing? Things that promote your faith. Or are you th hearing things that promote fear? Are you binging? I remember, you, like, back in the day, television went off. Now it's 24-7. How in the world you got, like, what is it? I won't name the name. Don't matter. These 24-hour news channels, and it's the same stuff over and over and over. And people will get up. I bet some of you got up this morning before joining us in our worship this morning. You got up and watch the news. To see what it said. What are, what are they talking about? What negativity, by definition, the news. I mean, even think about it. Even the weather, the guy's like, what's going to happen tomorrow? What's happening in California? What's happening in Nicaragua? What's happening here, there? And, right, because we're trying to draw you in because the human mind, fear and negativity are much more significant with regard to getting our attention to things that are positive. And so faith comes by hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. And so don't kill your faith. Don't, they call it doom scrolling, right? Looking through social media, trying to find the bad things. But focus on the things of God. Spend your time hearing from God, your time in prayer, your time in the word, your time spending time with other believers, listening to the word of God, listening to the songs of God, listening to those things that we know. And now research is catching up. Neuroscience says that when we fill our minds and our thinking with good things, we become optimistic. Our health improves. Our mental health improves. Longevity is increased by being optimistic. And so when we fill our mind, when we believe that faith comes by hearing, and hearing through the word of Christ, it changes everything. And then we can be the people who speak into our current situations. We can be the ones who can say, I refuse to participate in the divisiveness, but rather I'm going to pray. I'm going to seek the Lord. If I'm going to be involved in a political party, I'm going to bend that party's platform to the lessons, to the message, to the worldview of the kingdom of God. I'm going into my workplace. I'm going into my classroom. I'm going to be the person that brings the message of the kingdom, the good news, 
of the gospel, of the kingdom, I'll be the one to influence this moment in history through my faith. And so, people of God, my prayer for you today is that we have faith, that we allow God to help us reinvent ourselves as people who speak on behalf of the Lord. We speak words of encouragement. We speak words of upliftment. And we speak and walk in faith. And so today, if you've never surrendered your life to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, if you've never made him your king, I invite you, wherever you are, wherever you're watching, the Bible says if we will confess with our mouth that Jesus is our Lord, the boss, the CEO, our king, and then we believe, and again, not an intellectual sin, but we believe that Christ was raised from the dead for our sins, and then we begin to carry ourselves, we conduct ourselves, active faith. We live in alignment with our king. He says, then we'll be rescued. We'll be saved. We'll be saved from the penalty of sin. And so today I invite you to make Christ your king. And if you already have done that, but you find yourself overwhelmed by what's going on around you, if the news, the bad news, has you discouraged and depressed and anxious. I encourage you today to grab some faith. Listen to the words of Jesus Christ. Turn the television off. Stop watching the news if necessary. Get your Bible, man. Get your constitution of the kingdom that tells you how to live, that tells you the promises that belong to you. If you're feeling discouraged, you can read in the word that I'm more than a conqueror you're feeling anxious he says don't be anxious for anything but in everything with prayer and thanksgiving you make your wishes known he says listen and then the peace that passes all understanding it will set up guard around your heart your mind we are people of faith we refuse to allow the enemy take us away from our belief in God and who he is and what he said. And so I ask that you would join me now in prayer as we speak and proclaim faith over our lives. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord God, we give you thanksgiving for today. We thank you for being our God. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your kindness and your mercy toward us. We thank you, Lord God, for the life of Gideon, even a man, Lord God, who was afraid he was a coward. But God, you used him and you demonstrated it even through those of us when we're afraid. And we keep, we need signs. And we ask you, well, well, God, I'm not sure. You spake into his life. And you showed him that your word is true. And so, God, give us the courage, even if we have to ask for a sign. Lord God, to begin to take baby steps in faith. To come out of our anxiety, Lord God. To come out of our depression. Lord God, to believe that you are true and that your word is infallible. And that we can experience the abundant life that you have for us. And then, God, we can reinvent ourselves and we can then be those who will change the environments around us and bring them under the dominion of the kingdom. And so today, we pray with that brother or sister who doesn't yet know you. They ask you to come into their, their hearts, to take over their lives, to be their king. They surrender their wills to yours. And from today on, begin to walk in faith, knowing and believing that your words are true. And so today, if you have made Christ your king, I ask that you would just type into the chat. Somebody will follow up with you. or You're saying, you know, I'm back. You know, if if your faith was weak, but you're back, say, I'm back. I proclaim in faith that I'm going to be an overcomer, that I am victorious through Jesus Christ, my King. And so I thank you for your time as Pastor Cynthia to come as we prepare to receive our announcements. 
It's been a pleasure to spend with you today. Look forward to you to continue. Continue on. If you haven't engaged in one of our Bible studies, I want to encourage you to do that. It's critically important that we continue to hear God's word, that we join with our brothers and sisters. Because when you're weak, you have a brother or sister who's strong. And when you're strong, that brother and sister who's weak, you can lift them up. And so please get involved in a Bible study. We have many days going on. We have Sunday mornings, Wednesdays, Fridays. I think there may even be a Tuesday, Thursday, all kind of days. But get one of those, get one of those Bible studies, man. Get in that book, and God will build your faith in an hour you allow you to be victorious. Amen. And Pastor John did mention all of those Bible studies. And if one of those doesn't work for you, just get a couple friends and start one on your own. So um, again, thank you for that word. Uh, we have just a few announcements for this week. Please remember that uh, the first Friday of every month, we do a First Friday Fellowship, and it'll be a check-in time. We're going to celebrate our October birthdays. Hard to believe that it is October, uh, October this week, and we are also going to play a trivia game. So we do need to give a shout-out to Brother Casey Clouser, who was the first one, Princess Aurora. Now, Sister Courtney in Atlanta did come in late, but you got to be the first one in the chat for trivia. So, again, looking forward to playing with you guys Maybe on... Maybe delayed because she was in Atlanta. I, I don't know, but it's <laughs> the first one in the chat. So, anyway, we're excited about Friday. We're excited about our October birthdays and look forward to having you. So, you will get some information. Um, emailed to you early this week. If you're not a member of Bible Center, not a problem at all. You can call our office, 412-242-4920, and we'll make sure you get information about um, the, the Friday um, Fellowship. We will also have First Fridays with our youth, and so not only do we do programming with our youth on Saturdays, we have uh, BC Kids, which is our ministry online for preschoolers, and we have Children's Church, which is our uh, ministry online for elementary age children, but on the first Friday of every month, we have uh, First Fridays for youth, and so um, any um, of the things going on in ministry, you can always find out if you go to bcpgh.info, all of that information is there for you. Also on this upcoming Saturday, we have a Bible study. Our women do a first Saturday Bible study. It's Lies Women Believe, and so an exciting um, Bible study. Please join us. And again, you don't have to be in Pittsburgh to do that. So we want to talk now just about a way that everyone can engage in worship on today, and that is through your giving. Bible Center continues to operate in, in ministry. Um, even though we're, we're not all back in the space together, there is ministry going on literally every day of the week. And it is only because of your faithful giving. And I think, you know, just the message on faith this morning, sometimes we don't see God, um, see, see things the way God does. And we, you know, kind of have this lack mentality. And we, we don't exercise faith in our giving. But I encourage you to do that. God has blessed you abundantly and you have more than enough. And it's not just your wallet or your bank account. You can tap into um, just the resources of heaven. And so we're going to pray as you prepare your gifts. But please remember there are multiple ways that you can give. You can give through Venmo. You can give through Cash App. You can give through Tidely. Or you can go through the Bible Center website. And so, again, as you're preparing those gifts, let's pray. Dear God, we thank you for uh, the word this morning on faith, God. We want to see ourselves um, as you see us, God, that just like Gideon, mighty warriors of God. And so whatever um, you have spoken into our lives, God, I pray that this week that that word will go deep, that we will begin to see ourselves with faith, God, through faith, the way you see us. And so now, as gifts are being prepared, God, I ask that you would bless them. I pray even for that person who is going to test you in their giving today. God, maybe they've never given before, but on this morning, they're going to test you. And I ask, God, that you would just show yourself strong on their behalf. And so I ask, God, whatever resources are coming, that you would just bless them abundantly. I ask that you would be with those, God, at Bible Center who seek to steward the resources um, wisely and in accordance with your will. And so we pray all of these blessings in your name. Amen. Amen. And so uh, we do remember that the Rona is still real. And even though uh, things are lifting a bit and I see folks getting a little loose, uh, remember the BMW, right? <laughs> Back up, mask up, and what's the W? Wash up. Wash up. Come on, somebody. Not worship. Wash up. All right? And so remember, your pastor loves you. Tell somebody on the screen, yourself, point to you. 
Listen, say my pastor really, really loves me. I miss you guys. Look forward to seeing you and hopefully in the not too distant future. But in the meanwhile, continue to take care of yourself. Be safe and have faith. Amen. God bless you.